Thank you very much. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about that period which shaped the United States and made it what it is. One of the reasons you don't understand nations, you don't understand the intention in the foundation of the nation and who the nation was made for and how it was shaped. I'm going to deal with the period 1776, the American Revolution and aftermath. I'm going to end on the eve of the Civil War. This is the period when the intention of the nation was shaped to be what it is today. You have a lot of assumptions about this nation because you have not understood how it was shaped and who shaped it and what they shaped it for. All right, let's look at the American Revolution and see what the American Revolution was about. It was not about the liberation of anybody. It was a family dispute between a younger branch of English-speaking people and an older branch of English-speaking people. And the younger branch seemed to have had enough energy to win the war after almost losing the war. Now, how did the American Revolution come about? England was so involved in wars, wars at sea, internal religious wars. England had just become a Protestant country that had not settled down. England was in turmoil and could not hold all of its outer flank colonies intact. Now, while there had already been a revolt in its black colonies, Jamaica and in the outer colonies of the Caribbean, they did not have the military support to bring off a complete revolt that will free them from British domination. And besides, not being white, they did not have access to ammunition from, from Europe, other European nations, and did not have sympathy from other European nations, themselves slaveholders. Remember now, during the American Revolution, Lafayette came from France. Laflamme, the French architect, came later to design the city of Washington, left in a huff, and a brilliant black mathematician who was looking over his shoulders, Benjamin Banneker, remembered the plans, put them together, and really Benjamin Banneker, not LaFlante, is responsible for the design of Washington, D.C., one of the few American cities original designed for some kind of traffic. If you look at Washington, the center of Washington, you can see the streets can take traffic. The smaller streets in these outer areas, that wasn't in the original plan. So now, in the shaping of the United States, 
let's look, the British colony that is going to become the United States. You had a series of colonies, 13 different colonies with 13 different flags, all approving of slavery. Now, in the lower south, where the worst of the scum of England was dumped, out of prisoners, out of work houses, ladies of the evening and the night too. <laughs> Slavery was forbidden for a while. These were debtors and prisoners and, and the like. What you cannot understand is that Europe dumped its human garbage can into the so-called New World. The worst of that garbage can came to the United States. We inherited the worst of Europe. Not that, in, that there were flowers other places. Now in the New England states, some of the English came to escape persecution. Some of them were people of means, mostly in the southern states, people trying to better their condition. Large number of them were indentures. All right, I'm getting to the point, and the point is, where did we fit into all of this? What had happened to the Africans in the United States between 1619 and 1776. Let's focus on 1776, because during that period, on the eve of the revolution, there had been contact between the Caribbean free man and the black free man of New England. And if you look at the biography, Ruswam, Jamaica, Prince Hall, Barbados, Robert Campbell, Jamaica again, Peter Ogden, Antigua, if you look at the biography of all of these Caribbean people, not one called themselves a West Indian. Everyone thought of himself as an African person away from Africa and saw the plight of one African person identical with that of other African people. All right, now the revolution comes. The alleged hero, I'm using the word advisedly, the alleged first man to give his life in the American Revolution was Christopher, Christopher Adams. All right, I would not take a black hero out of history unless I got ten to replace him. I'm going to put him in proper perspective. Christopher Adams drinking with his Irish cut buddies, hanging out, everybody boasting about what they're going to do to the British. He just stumbled out of the bar ahead of the rest of them <laughs> and caught a bullet and got into his <laughs> world's great accidental hero. All right. Because white people say so many bad things about us, it's not true. When they say something good, it's not true. So we might as well let it ride. <laughs> okay. Christmas addicts of course, was one of the early casualties to the preface to the American Revolution. But as a matter of historical fact, the revolution hadn't started when he was killed. So to say that he was the first to die in the American Revolution is stretching a point. He did die, or right, let's give him all the honor due, do him. But he didn't die in the American Revolution because there was no revolution at the time. Okay. There were other black heroes in the American Revolution 
And I wouldn't take him out unless I was going to put them in. There were genuine heroes in the American Revolution. So at first, Washington didn't accept black Americans in the American Revolution. But there were several families, the Brazilla Lou family, the descendants still alive, some in Chicago and some around Boston. I've actually talked to someone on the telephone and I've greeted those in Chicago. Because they were light complected, Washington couldn't tell where they belong. So they fought right straight through the American Revolution. But now, the second brutal winter, Washington turned to a black friend, James Fotan. James Fotan was a tent maker and might be the first black uh, middle class or person of considerable wealth. And he told Fotan of the difficulty of the last winter and he looked at some of the heavy wax matter tent cloth and said the tent cloth you are using is much better than the cloth in our britches. Now, Jim, suppose you make some britches out of that cloth, and the britches made by James Fortan helped to save Washington's army during the second and the third, the last winters of the American Revolution. Peter Salem saved his life at one point near the end of the revolution. There was an attempt to poison Washington and Francis Tavern. Francis, who, Samuel Francis, who owned the tavern, tavern still exists, down around Wall Street area, was of Caribbean descent, a Caribbean free man. And his daughter, Phoebe, noticed the, um, the attempt to poison Washington, because that's where Washington went to eat. And she told Washington's intelligence, and that saved Washington's life. Okay, Washington took a liking to Francis. Francis, after Washington became president, and he became steward to Washington. And Francis, being a good cook and a restaurant man, began to invite people to the White House to have special food on Washington's birthday. This is the origin of Washington's birthday. By this Caribbean restaurant man. Now, because he was light complected, the assumption is that he was white. There is no proof that he was white. His daughter Phoebe seemed to have taken more from her mother's side. And it was much question that she belonged to us. But well, she saved Washington's life and when some major tried to play up to her romantically to cover up the secret of the attempt to poison Washington, she wouldn't buy that angle. All right. Now, the second year of the war, Washington began to accept blacks in the army. And they began to distinguish themselves in a number of the battles in the American Revolution. A woman, Deborah Gannett, disguised as a man and fought in the American Revolution, a black woman, nine months. 
And when they discovered, discovered her and discharged her with a pension, all this is recorded, <laughs> they gave her a certificate of virtue. I'm saying that that was the worst thing they could have done for her because her virtue wasn't even being questioned. <laughs> and she didn't need the certificate. No one had thought about that one way or the other. She, she had to have same quarters with men and same bathing facilities with men. And for that nine months, they said that she behaved like a lady and kept herself in a manner befitting the best of ladies. I don't know why they had to say that. They had to left it alone. Nobody would have thought about it. But be that as it may, be that as it may, this was an outstanding black woman in the American Revolution, also of mixed parentage. Now, we have to do something which we haven't done. We haven't made an assessment of Africans of mixed parentage who were great patriarchs for our cause and who went on the other side with their light complexion and brought back secrets that damn near saved us in many occasions. We have been dealing with the cop-outs so much. We haven't even dealt with those who endangered their very lives in behalf of the black side of the family. Now, there were a number of others in the American Revolution, and my main point is that we fought in this war, and having fought in the war, we got nothing out of that either. When Washington proposed to some of these families that they send someone to fight in the war, when some of these aristocratic families did not want to send one of their sons, they sent a slave instead. And they sent the slave with the promise that after the war, the slave would be free. Now, while we know so much about this, there is an almost classical book with a title that offends me a little bit called The Negro in Colonial New England by Lorenzo Turner. Now, and yet it's the best documentation on the subject, the most scholarly documentation could be Benjamin Quarles, The Negro in the American Revolution. But here you have case histories of blacks who fought in the American Revolution. It is from one of these case histories that I get the story of Manny's Sam. This black New Englander fought in the American Revolution. His master, he was a slave, his master was probably named Manny, and Sam is the only name they gave him. So he fought in the American Revolution. No doubt he endeared himself to his white comrades who taught him how to read and write while he was in the army. When he came out and they tried to re-enslave him, he took it to court. And all of the veterans who had fought with him came from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and all the states around to be moral support during the trial. All he needed was moral support. But with his rough-hued language that they had taught him, now he could read and write. He petitioned the Massachusetts court for his citizenship and his right to be a free man. And his petition is a great piece of American literature that could be printed separate and distinct from the trial and read as a piece of literature. Along the same line, 
was the work of Amos Fortune, whose life started in the American Revolution, but who um, continued and was a vestiment in a white church after the American Revolution. All right, we have been the people who made the first overtures to get along with other people. Now let's see what went wrong and how it went wrong. The making of the Constitution. It is now the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. Now, who made the Constitution? Who were they talking about? What were their intentions in the making of the Constitution? Now, because we dream so much, we do not understand that the American dream was never dreamed for us. The American promise was never made to us. And if you face this reality, you might understand what you have to do. Now, they're making a constitution. 52 days of deliberation in Philadelphia. They produce a two or three page document. Jefferson wants to bring up the problem of slavery. Benjamin Franklin tells him, don't open this can of peas. Jefferson, a double-dealing liar, he writes so eloquently about liberty in the Constitution, he's had liaisons with several black women and had several children by black women. Sally Hamas being the most consistent one. I think he had seven children by her. And if you go to Monticello, the Jefferson home, I talked about this so much they close, they close off that stairway. There's a, sta <laughs> there's a stairway leading from his bedroom to her bedroom. And yet Jefferson talks so much about liberty and justice and democracy he never freed Sally Hamas, the slave woman who bore him seven children. See, democracy for us was tainted from the beginning. Now, in the making of the Constitution, the Southern makers of the Constitution had a large non-voting constituency. Now, the Southerners were elected based on that constituency. They would not give the Southerner full credit for the slave, so they declared the slave to be three-fifths of a man. There is nothing in American literature, there is nothing in the amendments to the American Constitution that ever said you are a whole human being. Every black man, including me, who ever paid taxes is paying taxes on the false pretenses. We should never have paid any taxes because it was taxation without representation and still is. Now, in the whole concept of three-fifths of a man, many Southerners came to office based on the fact they had so many slaves in that constituency, though non-voting. So we see now the nation is shaping itself. Now in essence, 
who was the nation shaped for? And remember this, and I'll repeat it if you don't understand it. This nation was made for originally free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agree with the prevailing political status quo and who own property. And when they say in this country, liberty and justice for all, that is the all they are talking about. And they are not talking about women. They're not talking about Catholics. And they are not talking about Jews. Now you can play behind and be a servant to the power of the white male Protestant. But he will always be the dominant power in the country until he acknowledge and put in law and action that this country was meant for someone else other than himself. When someone asked recently whether the Constitution still prevails, Robert Harris, a professor at Cornell, asked, I hope, say, I hope not. I hope it don't still prevail. I hope there have been some changes. All these amendments, they still mean what they said originally. The president means what they said originally. This debate over this judge is what they said originally. But there are non-Protestants, whites, or pseudo-whites, who many times get a leverage by supporting the Gentile establishment and by rendering a service managing us. And they endear themselves to the Gentile establishment to the extent they keep us in line. Now you see where it started. Now you can see what other ethnic groups come in and manage your community, manage your stores, while the government even give them money to assist them in doing it. And while you are not the resident entrepreneurs in your own community. Now, I believe you can take back all of this community, any community, once you're organized to do so, and once you understand the global importance of African people in the world, you could actually do it. But you're so mesmerized by other people, you assume there's something magic about running a store marketing food and turning wheels and clocks and mechanics. And you forget that you did it first before they had shoes or lived in houses that had windows. What people make you forget, especially what you was and your historical memory generally controls you right now. Okay, the revolution is over. Where are we? In the South, still slaves. There are some free blacks in the South, terribly restricted. No vote, no public accommodations. There are some free blacks in New England, really, where the voice of the free blacks got heard but among those who heard the most, Prince Hall and his African Lodge, the first black Masonic order. Now blacks are beginning to organize. They're beginning to express themselves in poetry. 
They're beginning to express themselves in the slave narrative. They're beginning to question whether they go to the side door or the balcony of churches. Soon, Richard Allen, James Varick would challenge the white church and they would find the AME. Now the independent black church is on the way. You've got independent thinkers now. And we are approaching the 1800s. And as we approach the 1800s, we have the semblance of a church organization, the semblance of literary organization, the semblance of a protest movement. Now, as we came into the 1800s, let's look at that first half of the 19th century. Because this, in my opinion, was the most dynamic period in the history of black America. It was the most dynamic period because these blacks were clear about what they wanted to do and what they had to do than you are right now. They didn't have a whole lot of hang-up illusions that you've got right now. They weren't thinking about integration. They were thinking about surviving as a people. In the late 90s, 1790s, a sea captain began to take blacks back to Africa using his own ships. Now can you imagine now a sea captain with three ships doing trade on the sea of the world In the 1790s, and today we don't even own a decent rowboat. A master sailor with other sailors at his disposal. Now, as we came into the 1800s, more slaves escaping from the South the birth of the slave narrative, a special kind of American literature, finally the Douglas School, Frederick Douglass would begin publications, but 1800 itself, the first massive slave revolt. Gabriel Prosser in the Carolinas. Now you're beginning to see organization. Along with this kind of organization will be a different organization in the North. People are coming together. Martin Delaney, Frederick Douglass, the great minister Henry Highland Garnett, Poets are coming together, especially the great woman poet, Elaine Wilkins Harper, Phyllis Whitley, period. And I don't dwell on that because I'm not a great Phyllis Whitley fan. I thought she misread history itself, but be that as it may. The importance of Phyllis Whitley is that she wrote women wasn't writing much poetry during that period, good or bad. The fact that she wrote fair poetry. And there are some atrocious lines in some of them. One that turned me off is that, I'm glad God took me from my pagan land, taught my pagan heart to understand. She didn't come from no pagan land. Africa was no pagan land. 
in her tribute to George Washington and to some lord. Well, the fact that I'm not a Felix Whitley fan is established, so I can go on. <laughs> but during this period, a slave on Long Island produced the first cynical poem. And the poem went, my old master promised me when he died, he let me, set me free. Lived so long his head got bald, got out of notion of dying at all. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the beginning of cynicalism in black poetry. <laughs> I didn't believe it. <laughs> I, I don't believe the thing. All right, now, the black founding fathers as against the white founding fathers that Lerone Bennett writes about so beautifully in his work before the Mayflower. And the thing about Lerone Bennett as against John Hope Franklin, John Hope Franklin packs in a lot of historical information, but John's writing is so dull, I didn't say it's incorrect. <laughs> it turns you off. Lerone Bennett is not as scholarly as John Hope Franklin, but Lerone Bennett makes the language sing. And he don't turn you off a bit. You read all it, pick up his book, you read the whole thing. John Hope, you go to, go to sleep with you know, all these facts so packed on, you know, without, without interesting explanation. But I think in... Um, in Lerone Bennett's work, Before the Mayflower, in, in another work called The Shaping of Black America, the first two chapters, White Servitude, and the second chapter, First Generation, dealing with the first blacks to be brought to the United States. All right, now, let's look at the early period of Douglas. Let's look at the black giants, the people that Lerone Bennett called the black founding fathers. Better men, stronger men, true to democratic promise than the white founding fathers. Douglas, Allen, who found the Independent Black Church, along with James Barrick, the founders of our large organization, Prince Hall, the role of then of the Caribbean free men who came to the, the United States, the nationalist writings of Martin Delaney, sometimes referred to as the father of black nationalism. He said that to Douglas, I'm glad God made me a black man. And Douglas, who was part white, said, I'm just glad God made me a man. All right. Now we're into the period for we finding, we're finding our voices. We enter the period when Douglas would write his famous narrative. Other slave narratives would be written. Now there's another famous slave revolt, this time in Virginia. Denmark VZ a black free man who had known languages. An unfortunate circumstance would literally hold up the revolt. When you study slave revolts in this country, this was the best planned slave revolt. Everything worked against it. The horses that were supposed to be in one place stampeded and wasn't in the place to take the men to another place. 
rain and the bridge got washed out. They couldn't contact the people on the other side. The circumstances tend to work against him. His secret keepers, while they kept the secret, they themselves couldn't connect. Yet when they caught him and tried to force a confession out of him, he told them nothing. And from his silence came the spiritual. He never said a mumbling word. In other words, he didn't give nobody's name away. Now, black expression is taking a new turn. It will take a dramatic turn, 1829. Here we need to pause a little bit because this is a neglected aspect of our history. David Walker, an escaped slave, who owned a second-hand clothing store and a pawn shop, began to write an appeal to the colored people of the world. Now, David Walker could well be the first Pan-Africanist in literature. Not to the colored people of the United States, to the colored people of the world. And if you listen to the record that Malcolm X made last, one of them, called Message to the Grassroots, and read David Walker's appeal, David Walker was the forerunner of a Malcolm X. David Walker appealed to all blacks to take up arms against that slave master and to take your chances because continuing in slavery was a more difficult chance than gambling with your life with the hope of freedom. Now, David Walker's appeal enhanced some people and frightened some other people. Douglas did not associate himself with the appeal, though Douglas wanted freedom and thought there were less violent means to obtain it. David Walker, owning a secondhand clothing store where many of the sailors would come and pawn their winter clothes in the fall, or in the spring, and pick them up in the fall. When he wrote his appeal, he would put a copy in the pockets of these sailors. And this is how the appeal got to England. Someone opened a copy and took it to an Englishman who published it. Now the appeal is becoming worldwide. And David Walker would mysteriously die soon after. Remember something that I have said repeatedly. Any time a black man shows his people the real face of power and what to do about it in this country, he's either driven into exile driven to suicide or assassinated. And there is no exception. You can trace it from the death, the mysterious death of Dave, David Walker to the death of Martin Luther King. There were some lesser known ones who died, who got killed, that didn't come to public notice. But one of three things are going to happen to you in this country, if you show your people the real face of power and what to do about it. Now, so long as King was advocating nonviolence and sticking to that, he was comparatively safe. But when he engaged 
in sympathy for a garbage strike and begin to advocate a poor people's march on Washington uniting blacks and whites, this is the basis of political power. You're now challenging this nation in its direction. And we should have put a guard around him 24 hours a day, all sharpshooters, and somebody to watch the guards. <laughs> we are people lacking in suspicion, overly trusting, nearly always the wrong people. We treated them as guests at first. In this trait we still have. Many times we are kinder to the outsider than we are to the members of the family. This is a good trait properly used. When you want to find the strongest thing about a people, which is their concept of humanity, and that's one of the strongest things about us. The flip side of the strongest thing is also the weakest thing about you. You didn't watch who you were entertaining. You didn't watch who, was the, who you were inviting to dinner. All right. The next revolt to frighten the slaveholders would be the Nat Turner Revolt Hamilton Rose, Virginia. Also a well-planned revolt. In the Nat Turner revolt, his secret keepers were spread across four, na four, four states. And one of the secret keepers was his wife. This is why I took exception to the book Confessions of Nat Turner, because it made Nat Turner really a weakling lusting after a white woman. And there was nothing in history to prove that that was true. The scene was, the scene was a violation of history. All right. Nat Turner's revolt probably caused more fear in slave owners than any other revolt. And what Nat Turner's revolt was inspired by, in part, was the revolt in Haiti. Finally, black sailors going between the United States and the Caribbean islands heard that somewhere on an island, slaves had revolted and set up a free nation. When that information got back to the United States, some blacks thought they could do the same thing. It was a different lay of land, and given the circumstances, they could not have done the same thing. The fact that they thought they could do the same thing was an act of bravery and an act of courage. In Haiti, you had a black majority. You had Haiti's everlasting hill. And if you go to Haiti and Jamaica, you would wonder how anybody stayed a slave any time. Because you can go up in those hills and you can look down, you can see what's coming up at you, but what's coming up at you can't see you. And some good rocks properly <laughs> tipple down would discourage them. And there's plenty of rocks on those he in those hills. And throw down enough big rocks, they'll change their mind. <coughs> because those hills are fortresses, and great fortresses. We didn't have that. We didn't have running space. We were on level ground too many times. We didn't have access to the forest. We couldn't get to the hills although we were in a part of the country that had no appreciable hills. But the Nat Turner revolt 
had said something to this nation about the ability of the slave to sustain a long revolt. Finally, when they captured Nat Turner, tried him, the most unique thing Nat Turner did was this bogus confession. In this confession, he told about every member of his group that he knew was dead. And he was absolutely sure he was dead, he would tell it, uh, he'd talk about it. But if he escaped and still alive someplace, he didn't have nothing to say. When this white man who took down the confession, who hated his guts, kept uh, pumping him for more information, asking him, are you sorry? about all of this. You know how many people got killed. He kept emphasizing they were white people. <laughs> and he let, him, let it be known that the consequences of a revolt, some people get killed black and white. And the man persisted. He and that Turner in rags, blood, dripping all over him with whites tried to beat him to death before he could get the gallows out while they're building the gallows. Finally took him to the gallows, had the rope around his neck. And this white man is still pushing him for questions. Don't you think, aren't you sorry about what you did? Do you understand that you're going to die? Nat Turner bravely tilted his head and looked at the fool and said, didn't Christ die? <laughs> that was the end. <laughs> he just went on like a man. No weeping, no crying, no begging nobody to spare his life at all. He said, didn't Christ die? Then they hung him. <laughs> they ain't hung no crying man. They ain't hung no man begging for his life. He gave it up for a cause. He understood that before he started, that he would have to give it up. Now, the Nat Turner Revolt brought into being large numbers of laws, black codes, all kinds of codes. Douglas's voice is stronger now. A period in black America often forgotten is emerging now. The convention period. What is called the Negro Convention Movement. We have always been and still are the meanest people in this country. <laughs> We began, before slavery, to call meetings. And those free blacks were calling meetings, debating things. They'd created a literature, they created a church. Now, they'd created a convention movement. Let's have a convention Let's eat and talk. <laughs> and this is what they began to do. Part of the talk was about whether we would stay here or go back to Africa. Out of this talk would come black association with the American colonization movement. The American colonization movement stretching e even into the South, mostly financed by whites. Frederick Douglass peeped their hand and said, if you whites want to give blacks 
free trips back to Africa, why don't you free some slaves and give them the trip? I think they would enjoy it more. <laughs> Frederick Douglass saw that they were trying to get the free black out of America, especially the agitators. So Frederick Douglass, while not against people going back to Africa, was against the white control colonization movement. If you understand the colonization movement and how it was organized by liberal whites and some hypocritical whites who merely wanted to use the organization as a listening post to feel the pulse of black America, if you understand that, you'll understand the NACP right now. A lot of people think the NACP started out as a black organization, then you haven't read the history. Start off as a liberal white organization and they invited blacks in on that terms. And they're still mixed up based on the fact that people haven't studied foundation. When you understand what is at the foundation of something, then you can understand its intent. All right. Frederick Douglass would contact John B. Ruswan, the first alleged first graduate from an American college. It was later proven that there was another black American who graduated from a college a few months earlier. This is not an important item, which one graduated first or last. Well, anyway, I'm willing to let Russell have the job because he did such a good job in editing Freedom's Journal. And he, the other one didn't do, any, didn't do much for us and he got lost in the shuffle and we never know what happened to him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Russell made a major contribution to the literature of the argument for freedom. And his place in literature, his place in our literature of liberation is secure. When he stopped editing Freedom's Journal and decided to go to Liberia as the governor of Cape Palmas province, he established a newspaper, the Liberian Harrow, Harrow that is still in existence. And his answer to Douglas is that, while I agree with you that this is a white-run organization, and he was sponsored by the Virginia branch of the Colonization Society, at least we have the opportunity to show whites that we can control a nation. Now here is where some mistakes began to be made in relationship to the Western black and Africans. The mistakes still being made. Many of the Christian blacks went to Africa with the attitude they're going to civilize their heathen brothers. Not knowing that the people of Liberia were Mende speaking people, people who had brought into being the old empire of Ghana, Mali, and the last of the great African nation states, Songhe. Literally the most civilized Africans on the face of the earth at that time. And here are these bunch of fools that a white man's version of Christianity going back to Africa to civilize their heathen brothers who wasn't heathens in the first place and were more civilized than they are in the second place. Now, the American Liberian and the Caribbean Liberian, because they went from, from the Caribbeans and from the United States, 
mostly church oriented. And up until the emergence of Sergeant Doe, who's probably a CIA agent, Liberian, as against descendant of America or Caribbean Liberian. Liberia was run poorly by church members. People in the Congress were deacons and the ministers were presiding elders, many that were all church people misunderstanding the African concept of of spirituality as against the European rehash of African spirituality that he called Christianity. And he began to remake in Europe at the conference at Nicaea. Now this is not what the lecture is about. But we have to understand Africans had a spirituality before Judaism, Christianity, or Islam were interpreted by outsiders. And what we are talking about is out of this great body of spirituality in Africa came Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I'm saying that Africans had the original copy and they made carbon copies. This is why I'm still willing to refer to it as carbon copies of the original spirituality. Because in African religions, it wasn't departmentalized. It wasn't a Sunday thing. It was a thing that ran through the totality of your life and determined everything in your life, including your diet, your wife, and your, your child, your village, where you stayed. It, you didn't go to church on Sunday. You, your religion was a part of your life. Your spirituality was a part of your life all of the time. And in this, Africans respected all living things. Everything with life got respect, including the cockroach, including the tree, including what running water. You go to Egypt today, they had a god of the Nile called Happy. The Catholic Church would later break this down into saints. The African had an overall spiritual force and that God had many helpers. All the Catholic Church did just to call them saints. It's like happy was the God taking care of the now. The woman was the goddess, Newt, taking care of the son. Her job was to take in the sun in the evening, put it in her body, and let it out in the morning. They assigned something to everybody. But that didn't mean that they did not believe in the oneness of the spirituality that men would later call God, and create denominations that would fight among themselves. There wasn't but one, one overall spirituality taking care of everything. Well, someone broke it down into religions and denominations. That was probably man's highest hour of spirituality and purity on this earth. Everything had a soul, including the dog or the pig was the highest hour of respect for humanity, too. All right, now let's get back to the end of this first half of the 19th century. What do we have now in motion? We have the embryo of American industry. 
you have the beginning of the experimentation that's going to be the cotton gin. Ideas taken from blacks. You have cotton in demand in Europe, but Europe is not getting it fast enough. You do not have enough work for the slave to do in the South. The cotton gin is going to change the whole nature of slavery. It's going to make cotton king. Now, by the time the cotton gin was invented, the abolitionists, mostly New Englanders, black and white, had started the campaign for the liberation of the slave. Now the South would answer them truthfully, a truth that we're still not willing to deal with. They would tell the New Englander, you sold us to slave, and now you Northern abolitionists who took our money for the slave are now telling us to liberate the slave. You sh you, now you're showing the slave how to escape. And you're a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> now on face, they were right. The law was a bunch of hypocrites then, a bunch of hypocrites now. <laughs> the law could eliminate, could have put enough pressure on the South to eliminate Jim Crow without any fight and without any civil rights movement. And they didn't do it. The North, the industry of the North, the money of the North was gaining more and more control over the South. Literally a stranglehold on the South. Now the South is beginning to demand a greater share of the wealth of the country. But the way they arranged it the New Englanders who had produced the industry would refine the raw material mostly coming from the South. They wanted to keep the South agrarian in farms. They wanted the woods from the South, the hides from the South. But the South partly willing with the agreement that you leave my labor supply alone. That without slaves, I can't even send you the raw material with the same degree of profit that I've been sending it to you. Now the argument is between two branches of English speaking people. Now if you think White people fought a war for four years, cutting each other apart for you. Then it wasn't water you was drinking this morning. You just picked up the wrong glass. <laughs> they not only didn't do it, they would not have done it. Slavery was now becoming an emotional issue, an issue for debate between two men who did not believe and said publicly, repeatedly, they did not believe that the slave would ever be the social equal of other people, that he would ever fit into the society. And the person who said it best and said it more often was Abraham Lincoln. Now, on the eve of this catastrophe, some smart Missouri lawyers decided to put to task the escape slave law and the assumption that if a slave went into so-called free territory, 
he would automatically be free. So they used a slave who had previously put the law to a test without success and who for quite some time was trying to buy his own freedom and had bought the freedom of some other members of his family but had not accumulated sufficient money to buy his own. What looked to be a mild Uncle Tommy's slave called Dred Scott. Dred Scott was an activist against slavery before whether those who chose him to make the test case knew it or not is something history hasn't revealed to us. But Dred Scott was no mild, inactive slave, peaceful in slavery. So they went through the trial. The trial got the attention of the whole nation because the way the trial went would determine the condition of slavery in the United States. Finally, the trial is over and the decision comes from uh, the Chief Justice, Tanny. Who is Tanny? You've got to understand this. Tanny is a second generation Irish. His own family had been indentures, white slaves. Now, he is rendering a decision against a black slave. And that decision he rendered in 1857 still holds for this nation. And you'd better remember it. He said, no black man has any rights that a white man is bound to respect. That is the global approach between black men and white men this very day. No matter what the law is, you only have those rights he chooses to respect and none he feels bound to respect. That's what Howard Beach was about. That's what the debate with this judge is about. That's what our life in this country is out of kelter with the rest of the lives of people and we are a nation within a nation searching for a nationality. <coughs> no people can free themselves unless they have a nationality, an identity. An Italian would say Italian-American, German would say German-American. He's putting a nationality onto his citizenship. So long as you say American, you're out. I'm a Caribbean person, I'm a British y'all. <laughs> British by way of what? <laughs> Who made you a British y'all? You weren't no British when they brought you out of Africa. <laughs> and we weren't no Americans when they brought us out of Africa. The name of a people must always relate them to land, history, and culture. And any time a people give you their name, if the name fails to reflect a relationship to land, history, and culture, you have called them out of their name and they are confused about the role of a people in the world. No people can establish themselves in the world until they relate 
to land, history, and culture. Over and above that, their slave master chose for them. And so long as they choose a name out of their slave master's culture, they are a slave to their slave master. All right, now, we are approaching the Civil War. The black abolitionist has done great service, many times greater than the whites. John Brown has approached Frederick Douglass to join him. Frederick Douglass has refused, not only because it is violent, but he, he's assuming that if blacks joined him, it would give America an excuse literally to commit genocide against all the blacks. And he could well have been right. John Brown pursues his course that leads to Harper's Ferry and his death. John Brown may well have been the only white person who paid full dues in our club. The rest of them are associate members. John Brown might be a full member. And the only way to be a full member, you've got to lay it on the line and if, if necessary, give it up. <clears throat> All right, now we are approaching a period in history when America is made facing a catastrophous civil war that will remake the country. We would, of course, fight in that civil war in large numbers, and we would distinguish ourselves. After the civil war, we would put down old troubles and pick up some new troubles. And the new troubles are still with us and stayed with us through the end of the second half of the 19th century. That's what the next lecture is going to be about. Thank you very much.